But what do these words mean to you and me today? Grace and peace. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for your patience with us. And help us, Lord, today, Lord, to surrender our hearts to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We read from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. But where is grace mentioned? Or oh, just put it, put it this way. Where do we first encounter grace in Scripture? Well, you turn all the way back to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. And there we read, turn the Bible to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. And what does the Bible say? I still hear some pages turning. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Interesting to note that Grace is introduced with a contradicting conjunction. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Meaning that whatever grace is, it is in contrast to whatever came before verse 8, right? And what comes before verse 8? Well, I know verse 7, but the context is this. God has said that evil was so rampant, so wicked in all the earth, that he made a decision to destroy everything that didn't live in the water. Right? So man, beast, creeping thing, if it moved on the earth, it was subject to destruction. And then we see, it says, but, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, we can deduce that finding grace in God's eyes saves us from eternal destruction. Amen? So, grace is introduced in the midst of trouble. Ten other times in, script, in Genesis... Where grace is mentioned, Genesis 19, 19, Genesis 32, 5, Genesis 33, 8, 10, 15, chapter 34, verse 1, chapter 39, verse 4, chapter 47, verse 25 and 29, and chapter 50, verse 4. And in every instance that grace is used, there's trouble or impending trouble, Okay. Now, why is that important? Why, why, how do we understand what was the significance of that? Because the word meaning that, we, that is translated as grace, it means kindness or favor. And it is derived from a word that means to be gracious or to pity. According to the theological word book of the Old Testament, the verb Hanan, from which we get Hannah and Anna and many other such names mean, meaning grace. It depicts a heartfelt response by someone who has something to give to someone who has a need. Okay? Grace is, some, is defined as a heartfelt response by someone who has something to give to one who has a need. One other commentator defines it as this. An action from a superior to an inferior who has no real claim for gracious treatment. 
and the action of a superior to an inferior who has no real claim for gracious treatment. In Exodus, grace is mentioned on six occasions in five verses, and I want you to turn there with me. Exodus chapter 33. I'm just laying the foundation to see how we are introduced to this idea of grace in Scripture. Because, you know, many people think that grace in, is that's a New Testament concept. But in Exodus 33, this is after the children of Israel have been waiting patiently for Moses to come down from the mountain. And he takes a little longer to come back. And so they make themselves gods like they had in Egypt. They made a golden calf. They worshiped the calf. Moses came down. Says at the end of verse thirty, chapter thirty-two, verse thirty-five. It says, "The Lord plagued the people because they made the calf, which Aaron made." And now, in the interaction between uh, after this, God gives orders to march to continue on to the promised land. And there's this dialogue between God and Moses. Verse eleven says. Chapter 33 of Exodus. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again unto the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. That's a whole other sermon for another time. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou has also found grace in my sight. So, who gives grace? God. Moses continues, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And, verse 17, God responds, well, if we can go to verse six, 16, Moses is still speaking. He says, If your presence will not go with me, don't take us up. For where shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth? And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken of. For thou hast found grace in my sight. And I know thee by name. So just right there we see that understanding that grace is the gift of God. It also is a special, is, is God's special favor. Allowing here we see Moses to ask God to do what seems to be uh, supernatural things. Likewise you and me. When God bestows his favor upon us, we have the opportunity and the privilege to ask of him the things that we desire. Again, we see here grace is connected with trouble. Because the children of Israel are to take this journey to this place. But they un God understands that the, that the road that they travel to make it to this place is fraught with peril. And so, the trouble in this instance will be getting to Canaan without the providence and protection of God. The same trouble that we deal with today. Salvation by something other than grace. See, it's not so, it's not so far off for us today. Now, in the New Testament, we're introduced to grace by Luke. And he mentioned this in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, where it says, he's speaking of Jesus, and he says, And the child grew and waxed strong. Is that what it says? Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. 
And the child grew and waxed strong and spirit filled with wisdom and what? And the grace of God was upon him. If Jesus needed grace, how much more do you and I? Huh? And the word there used is charis, from which we get our word charisma, charismatic. We say of one who is full of charisma, he has the, he or she is very charismatic. They have the ability to influence people, you know. But it really means graciousness of manner or act. Originally, it's derived from a word that means to be cheerful or calmly happy. Now, in the writings of John, grace is always connected with Jesus Christ. Turn a few uh, pages over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 14, 16, and 17. John chapter 1, verses 14, 16, and 17. And there we read, it says, And the word was made, and did what? And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the... And how was that described? Full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. And then it goes on in, in, in verse 17. It says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came how? By Jesus Christ. In his second epistle, John also writes, Grace be to you, mercy and peace from God the Father and our Lord, from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and in love. And to the seven churches in Asia, he begins this letter by reminding them that grace be to them and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And he goes on to describe the triune God. You know, we open up Bible, we read scripture, but do we understand that, you know, these letters were not written because they had nothing else to do. These letters were written because they were a, I, there was either an individual problem or problems to be addressed in a church. And if you've been in the church for any length of time, you know in order for problems to be solved correctly, we need grace and peace will follow. Amen? Now, let's take a look. So, and notice, in all the writings, it always says grace and peace. It never says peace and grace. Because grace always precedes peace because you can have no peace without grace. Because it takes grace, God's unmerited favor, and how he deals with us, we in turn extend that to each other, peace will follow. You can't have peace. You don't get peace and then hope to get grace. You get grace and peace follows. Right? Grace, Christ always, it always comes, grace and peace. Even in the introduction into the scripture, we, we learn about grace in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 15 is when we first introduced to the idea of peace. It is in the context of Abraham. God is making a covenant with Abraham. And he paints a picture that is not pleasant. He says to Abraham, your descendants in the fourth generation will go into a land that is not theirs and they will be slaves for 400 years because the cup of the Amorites is not yet full. God is going to allow the, Ab the descendants of Abraham to suffer while he continues to extend grace to these Amorites. But he says to Abraham, don't worry, you will go to your grave in peace. What does he mean, in peace? It's this context, this word we use, shalom, this idea of wholeness. Today we would talk about 
when we speak of holistic medicine, we're talking about the whole person. So, so peace, in Hebrew, they, they greet each other with the greeting of shalom. It, it means peace and health and prosperity and, uh, and wellness. You know, in, in, in Greek, the, the word is Irene. Irene. Um, names like, like, like John also, that's derived from grace, uh, from the, you know, so a lot of our English names, um, carry this, this, this idea of grace and peace. But we are introduced to, so we introduced to grace in the Old Testament with the story of Noah. And in, in the Old Testament, we introduce the peace with this promise that God is going to make a covenant with Abraham. And it's important to know that when they made a covenant, a covenant was a very important thing because the penalty for breaking the covenant was what? Was death. Of the person who signed the covenant. And God is the one originating this covenant to Abraham. All right? So, this idea of grace and peace, it doesn't start with us. It's, it's God's gift to us to help us in our daily Christian experience. Okay? Jesus introduces this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 13, when he, he's writing to these, he's telling the disciples, you know, he called them in chapter 9 and he's sending them out. And he says, if you go to a house and the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return with you. Now, we saw earlier in John's writing that grace is always associated with Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at what John has to say about peace. Turn in John chapter 14, verse 27. John 14, 27. And there the Bible reads, what does it say? Peace I leave with you. Whose peace? Jesus says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let neither your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You fearful today? You fearful that the doctor is going to tell you that it's not what you thought it was? Jesus says, my peace I give unto you. You fearful that the court is not going to turn in your favor? Jesus says, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives. Because when God gives you something, he doesn't take it away. You might decide that you don't want it. But God doesn't take it away. He doesn't give it to you to take it back from you. So when John, uh, I want to turn to another place in John, chapter 16. John chapter 16. Um, I think it's verse. Where's my little notebook? Oh, here we go. John chapter 16. Verse 33. What does it say there? John says, Jesus is speaking. John records it. Jesus says, in me, you will have what? Peace. So if you're not having peace in your innermost soul, you need to check yourself, right? If you're troubled, we need to check ourselves. In chapter 20 of John, verse Verses 19, 21, and 26. Verses 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for what? 
for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, what? Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. See, evidences of what? Of his grace. See, God didn't die because he didn't have anything else to do, you know. Those scars are evidences of God's grace. God's unmerited favor towards you and me. He says, peace be unto you. And when he showed him his hands, then, the disciples, then were the disciples what? Glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said unto them again, peace be unto you. As my father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And then eight days later, Thomas, who was not present, he is present. And Jesus appears again. And he says unto Thomas, peace be unto you. So here's John in prison. Writing to seven churches that are near and dear to his heart. And these churches, remember we talked that letters are not just written for no reason. These churches are facing some tough times. We studied this morning in Sabbath school. The church at Ephesus is a loveless congregation. The church at Sardis are facing death and persecution. The church at Thyatira, sorry, at Pergamos, is facing peer pressure. To compromise. The church at Thyatira has become tolerant of sin within themselves. The church at Sardis is self-deceived. The walking dead. The church at Philadelphia is encouraged to hold on. And the church at Laodicea, well, they got it all together. They got it so together that the Christ who was in the midst of the candlesticks is now on the outside knocking to be let in to the church. And John begins by saying grace to you and peace because brothers and sisters, the only way we overcome these issues in our life is through the grace of God. It is not, it is not, you know, you can't try harder. We only try, we only do better because God's grace is bestowed upon us. You know, every morning we get up when we are alive and our heart beats. It's beating grace, 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 grace. The Bible says the wages of sin is death and you and I are not dead. So we are only here by grace. Every day, grace, grace. Grace. God's unmerited favor. But here's the thing, you know, sometimes we as, 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 as sinners, as, as mortals, we get, we say, you know, well, well, how could God love me? And how could, you know what? Get those ideas out of your head. God made you and me in his image. And you have to start seeing yourself, and I need to start seeing myself as God sees us. Whereby it says, Paul writes, says that we are adopted into the family of God. Into the beloved. God chose us. He tells us that in John 15. He says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. So God has chosen us. And chosen to bestow upon us his grace. And the subsequent peace that comes from experiencing that grace. And then he tells us, this is how we ought to deal one with another. The book of Revelation begins with this appeal to grace. And then the last verse of the Bible, the very last verse in scripture says this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You see, God's desire is for you and me to be saved. 
And his desire is that we would take hold of the grace that is available to us. But I want you to see that this grace John writes about in Revelation chapter to 1. Three things I'm going to point out here and then we're going to close. It says, Revelation 1, 4 to 6, Grace be unto you and peace from him. What does it say? From him what? Which is? Which was and which is to come. What is that? We say, we say past, present, and future. But how does the text read? Which is what? You see? The God who gives us grace is the God who is present right here, right now. In whatever your situation is, that's the God that's, that's giving you grace. The God who is. He's present right here, right now. He was. He is. And he is to come. And also from the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ. So it tells me that grace and peace requires all the Godhead. So these gifts that God gives you, think of it, you know, it's like everybody contributed to these gifts. The gift of grace, it didn't just come from Christ and not from God the Father. It came from the entire Godhead. And it is there for us to deal with peer pressure and persecution. And when we feel unloved, and as the sister said this morning, when you feel rejected, it is God's grace that gets you through. See, because God does not reject us. And we can record the goodness of God. And know that we are accepted in the beloved. And know that God has a plan for us. And know that God will bring us to an expected end. You see, and these are the things that bring peace in your life. Not focusing on where you fell or where you failed, but focus on the fact that there was a God who was present when you fail and who was not willing to abandon you while you fail. You know, when we lose loved ones, it stings. And after everybody leaves and then you're by yourself and the reality of the emptiness sets in, it hurts. But in those dark moments, there's a God who is, who says to you, my grace is sufficient for these things. And in those difficult times, we have to believe that God's grace is sufficient for these things. And then we begin to experience that peace which passes all understanding. And this was by God's design. You know, think of the cross. God had a plan. And he said, I'm going to make these creatures. And I'm going to give them the ability to say yes or no freely to me. And in the event that they choose to say no, I'm still going to woo them and not give up on them. I'm going to love them into a relationship with me. And I know they don't deserve it. But I'm going to do it anyhow. Because God's nature is to love. God's nature is to be kind. It says when he reveals himself to Moses, he says the Lord, the Lord 
Merciful and what? Gracious. Gracious. There's another word for kind. You know, today, kindness is a thing of the past. You know? Heard a story this week. There's a lady in Walmart. And she's very short. She was very short. This happened right here in Lawrenceburg. And she was in the, the, the section for uh, bottled water. And she needed some bottled water, but it was up high. So she climbed into her cart. And she's standing there struggling to get this water off shelf, right? And people just passed by and looked and laughed and snickered. But she said, you know what? Nobody stopped to help me. A simple act of kindness. They probably videotaped it and posted it on Facebook, Instagram. So here's this little lady struggling to get water. But nobody stopped to think, hey, let me help the kindness. Simple, just simply being gracious. Huh? I mean, that could have gone so, I mean, if that cart took off, you know, well, she, it, it could have been really bad, right? But a simple act of kindness. How many times things happen and people just walk by simply because they don't want to be involved? I got a text. I have a, uh, 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 God has a sense of humor. Talking about being gracious. There's a lady that's been, an elder lady has been friend, trying to friend me on Facebook for, oh, it had to be more than two years. And for some reason, you know, after a while, it just didn't see it anymore. And in the last month or so, it just popped up. And I say, you know, the Lord said, just, you need to accept the friend re request. And I did. Send her a friend, let her know, you know, I accept your friend request. How are you doing? Two days later, she posted this on Facebook. I am lonely and in need of interaction. She has, this is a, she has a, what, a vascular, some medical condition that doesn't allow her to get around. So she's kind of confined to her apartment or somebody come to take her to uh, doctor's appointments, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, you know, she, she finally cried out and says, you know, hey, I need people to talk to me, check up on me, that kind of stuff. Um, and I thought, Lord, For so long, I refused. You know? Because of whatever preconceived ideas I had. There are many people out there starving for attention, interaction. I'm not talking about those who can do for themselves, but I'm just saying that just simple acts of kindness. Little ways to tell the world that God still lives. So in closing, I want to remind us all of this. Problems we have in this life, problems we face in this church, can only be solved when we fully embrace the grace that comes from God as we deal with each other, whether in the church or outside the church. It's easy to get hostile. It's easy to do the thing that makes you feel good. It's easy to tell off that other person. It's easy to ignore that other person. But it takes a little more effort. It takes a little dying of self to be willing to extend to someone else that grace, that kindness. 
you know? When we're driving, that person wants to get in front of us, or we like we determine, nope. No way on God's good green earth. A ain't that the truth? Not today. Maybe maybe tomorrow, but not today. Alright? Not gracious in our driving. And and then if they and then if they're presumptive, if they're presumptuous and, and do it anyhow, we electronically let them know how we feel. We don't always say it out loud, but we say it electronically anyway. But God is calling us, you and me, this church, to be gracious. That we may have peace that passes all understanding. Because then people will know that we belong to God. You know, visitors come here and they always say, you know, this, this church is, is, I've never expected to see a church like this church. And that is not because we are such nice, wonderful people by ourselves. But it is because as individuals, we are learning to embrace God's grace. And we're learning to love each other in spite of each other. And his blessing reigns upon that. So little ones, when you deal with each other, be gracious one to another. Recognizing that your kindness, as the Bible says, a soft word can turn away great wrath. Your kindness, your little kindnesses can smooth over a lot of misunderstanding. Ellen White puts it this way. There's a lot of religion in a loaf of bread. And I know from personal experience, a loaf of bread can calm a roaring neighbor. So I'm just encouraging you, encouraging myself, to remember that we are all God's children. Let's bow our heads. Father, this week, sorry, Lord, this day, even right now, may we accept and understand, Lord, our station in life. You called us. You've adopted us as your children. And you continually extend to us, Lord, grace and peace you give to us, Lord. We live in a world, Lord, where we face trouble and tribulation on every side. So, Father, I'm asking on behalf of your people here this morning, that whatever trouble there is facing them individually, that they may be reminded that your grace is sufficient for those things. May they leave here, Lord, with the peace, the assurance, Lord, that you are the God who is, who was, and who is to come. Thank you, Lord, for being our ever-present help in a time of trouble. Lord, we pray that you will help us to extend the grace you have given to us to those we come in contact with. Make us, oh Father, more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.